It's a great big flag and it's beautiful. But I just can't wait to see it flutter in the breeze the first time. They just want everybody to remember what the flag means, what it should mean. They're really great people. They're doing things for this random kid whose father got killed fighting for his country. It's bringing community together and there's a buzz about it. Basically, like that felt like the state of Utah was driving up the driveway with us. It's amazing to me that so many people would come together to do this. It really has taken on a life of its own. We, we literally now at this point, we're trying to like hold the reins on this. The community involvement, all the youth that are involved. Four score and seven years ago. People are just getting around it and it's becoming more and more of a huge patriotic symbol. Yeah. <laughs> a special environment to be in. Some people have called it hallowed. It's what's behind the flag and what the meaning is in those colors and in those stars. Go a little faster. Easier said than done. <laughs> I had blisters when I came off the mountain. We had done 2,000 heave hoes. And we counted them. Ho! And it was four men Ho! on that line. You know, that's the sound of the man. He's back. Working on the chain. Oh, it was, it was a struggle because we didn't have a lot of guys up there. And so we were just like just pulling a couple hours. We finally got it. One flag, two men, a group of Boy Scouts, and a load of rigging materials set in motion a movement that has impacted thousands. Now we will present the colors. I've never been involved in something that has impacted people so much or so many people. For me, just knowing that I was a part of that and hanging that, it just gave me like ultimate satisfaction. What started as a surprise gift to their small community. July 3rd, the sun set and no one knew what was happening. Has become a valued tradition. And then they woke up that morning. We actually came the first year they hung a flag in a canyon. I was just in awe and didn't even get my hand to my heart. And then uh, I remember thinking right in that moment as the flag was being unfurled and they're gonna need help next year. The Follow the Flag project had humble beginnings. Kyle rolled over in bed one morning and he said, I think I'm going to hang a giant flag in Grove Creek Canyon. And I will never forget that. I just knew that that was, that was something that was going to be huge. Right away, Kyle Fox enlisted the help of good friend and rigging specialist Ron Nix. He says, I'd like to hang a flag in the canyon. In Grove Creek Canyon, I saw someone that did that north on a smaller scale and we'd like to hang a flag. And I said, absolutely. They sought the support of local companies and low VA rates in Linden helped provide some funding. Their ideals parallel exactly with what we are, you know, supporting and helping veterans, um, loving our country. Basically, we purchased the flag and, and uh, then I had a bunch of rigging resources that I had personally through my company. Initially, it was an opportunity, a stunt that we pulled. We wanted to surprise the community, you know. We, we didn't want anyone to know we were coming. How did you decide that it had to be the size of a basketball court? Well, you know, all my life it's go big or go home, right? It was our hope to be able to have something hanging for the people that when they came up the canyon to go on a hike that morning that we could, um, that we could touch hearts. And their hope was realized. Almost as soon as the flag went up, tender emotions were brought to the surface. It just felt like hallowed ground. I think it's angel wings that lift the flag. Next, what happens when a Gold Star mom sees the flag in the canyon for the first time? Getting out of the car, it was so peaceful up there. That flag was the same symbol that she had to drape across her 18-year-old son's coffin. 24, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 24. For Teresa Hunt, July 14, 2004, was supposed to be just like any other day. But on that day, her worst fears materialized. And the doorbell rang, and I opened it, and there were st two uh, soldiers standing in dress uniform. Her son Matthew had died while on active duty in the military. And all I remember is falling down to my knees and crying. 
it's just like in the movies. Only worse because it was mine. That moment changed her life forever, and she became what the military describes as a gold star mom. I got to be on the tarmac when they took him out of the plane in a cargo box. They were going to put him in the hearse in his cardboard box. And I, over my dead body, is he going in that hearse without his flag on his casket? He needed to be shown the respect that he earned by standing and volunteering. The flag has always been important to Teresa. I'm the daughter of a retired Lieutenant Colonel Air Force fighter pilot, and my grandpa was part of the Doolittle Raid. The flag's always been important because we've always had military in our family. And now, as a Gold Star mother, the flag represents so much more. The moment they put a flag on top of your son's casket, it has a whole different meaning. And so when Teresa first saw a giant flag flying in Pleasant Grove Canyon, it was this passion that fueled her. Slamming her door and stomping up the parking lot and yelling at us and, what's going on here? How come I didn't know about this? And telling me that she buried her son. So, yeah, makes me cry. Um, but yeah, it's, it's um, to her, it became a connection with her son. It really kind of hit me, the impact, and what we were doing, the magnitude of what we were doing. It was in that moment, the mission of the Follow the Flag project became clear. Heavenly Father dropped a bomb on me. So, I didn't serve a mission or my country. So I realized, what can I give back? They have brought so much patriotism back into this community. And so from the very beginning, people stepped in to help. As the flag went up that first year, I think it was one of those places where I thought, okay, I need to help. There's gonna be more things that we can do. Each year, thousands of volunteer hours are logged, new ideas are shared, and enthusiasm increases. Working with Kyle, things move fast. He will throw an idea out, and that idea will snowball very quickly. Plans were set in place to hang the largest ever free-flying American flag. It's probably the hardest rig that I've ever had to pull off, and I've, and I've rigged pretty much all over the world. good we are doing, the more opposition is handed to us. Two years into the Follow the Flag project, founders Kyle Fox and Ron Nix look to expand their vision. So a friend, Dennis, came to me and he was mentioning that uh, it wasn't the largest, largest flag that had been in Utah. When Utah became a state in January 4th of 1895, they made a flag that uh, was large enough to cover the whole ceiling of the tabernacle where the, the ceremony for the statehood was done. And then it was next uh, draped off of the south side of the temple. And I just asked him, had they ever considered having a larger flag made? So I took that as a challenge. They set to work, creating the largest free-flying American flag in the United States. We have the flag that's 78 feet wide and 150 feet long. Each stripe is six feet wide. So it's about 11,800 square feet. Each star is about 55 inches, and they're about seven feet apart. Weighing in at well over 400 pounds, hanging this beautiful behemoth was a logistical feat. It's not like we have a flagpole that we're putting it on. We're putting it across a 1,200-foot canyon. It took over 70 people just to carry the flag up the mountain. The logistics of pulling this off was uh, probably one of the more challenging rigging jobs that I've ever done. Picture a shower curtain with all of the rings and we have all of these carabiners. Each carabiner is hung on that line and we have a rip cord that's going through that, that uh, when they pull that cord, the flag comes unfurled. So here we had this big announcement, this world's biggest flag. We had people coming, you know, everybody's come to see this and the flag was jammed. 
and the sun was setting. So Kyle, Ron, and a handful of others worked through the night, trying to unjam the line. I got the resources we needed. We strapped them onto a backboard, and uh, we packed it up the mountain. And it was dark, so we couldn't really see. We actually had a word of prayer. You know, we asked for help that this would all um, work itself out. But even after all their work, there was still some doubts. Would it fly? And here's this grown man kneeling at the side of my bed, and he's sobbing. And he's saying, the cord is stuck, and I don't know what we're going to do. Boy, there were a lot of prayers said that night. The morning of the ceremony, when that thing unfurled in slow motion, just, I mean, one piece at a time, it just started, and it just unfurled so beautifully. There's no doubt in my mind that the Lord's hand is in it. Every fold that came out, every time that it went through a carabiner, I'm just like watching and just praying. It's like, okay, there's one, there's two, and just watching it you know, as it's coming undone, and finally the whole thing comes out and just bellows. The flag has uh, been a part of my life since I can remember when. World War II hero Gail Halverson joined Kyle Fox, Ron Nix, and others to help create the largest free-flying flag in the U.S. You ready? Go for it. Gail Halverson actually yeah. sewed on the very first star in addition to members of the committee. Having served as a transport pilot in World War II, Halverson is affectionately known as the Candy Bomber. Patriotism runs deep in him. You have these blessings because of others. The Patriots have gone before. The Patrick Andrews, the Nathan Hales, give me liberty or give me death. I'm grateful for those who have, who have gone before. Halverson's service in the military began early. I was 21 years old. He witnessed horrific atrocities while flying missions during the war. It was a brutal environment, leaving many deeply scarred. But Halverson's heart was touched when talking to a small group of children outside an airbase in Berlin. Don't worry about us. We don't have to have enough to eat. Just don't give up on us. Someday we'll have enough to eat. We you lose your freedom, we'll never get it back. He wanted to give them hope, so he shared all he had, which was only two sticks of gum. Not nearly enough for everyone. And then he did something uncharacteristic. Just told the kids, that's gonna break the regulation. I said, come back here tomorrow and stand in that open place. And when I come over your head, before I come around to land over East Berlin, I'll wiggle the wings to the big airplane I've got. And I'm gonna drop enough gum and even chocolate. During the war, he and his buddies airdropped 31 tons of candy. That's how he got his nickname, the Candy Bomber. The little decisions you make in your life, put your footsteps on where you end up, for good or bad. And you got a guidance system built into every one of us. He learned early, it's the small and simple things that make a difference. The thing that you need to do is get outside yourself in the cause of freedom. And the main thing you can't forget is the countless of patriots who've gone before. After all these years, seeing the flag fluttering in the breeze still brings him a thrill. And that's why he's involved with the Follow the Flag project. Now, to see that huge flag unfold, biggest one in the world had ever done, in the beauty of nature between two big peaks. The Follow the Flag project has inspired people around the world. U.S. Army First Lieutenant Trevor Barton saw a story about it online. In Afghanistan, Trevor was looking for something to lift the spirits um, for his company, and he knew that if he looked in, at Utah, he could find something. A group of people plans to raise what they believe will be the largest American flag ever flown. It was an interesting story. It was one that showed a community coming together for something positive. After finding the story, Trevor sent a note of gratitude. I just reached out and let him know, hey, thank you for representing the, the state that I know so well in such a positive way. It really helped inspire my soldiers today. That was how the initial exchange started. One thing led to another, and Trevor was in invited to speak at the July 4th ceremony in Grove Creek Canyon. He gave a, a very powerful and emotional um, message to us that day and um, he also was there presenting his troop streamer to us. When this streamer joins that flag, it carries with us all the soldiers in that picture. 
So now, wherever we go with that flag, we are sure to take that streamer and show our respects to his troop. Next, follow the flag turns a dream into a reality for a family in Texas. He didn't hesitate to, to volunteer. It's a gift that leaves them in tears. <laughs> Patriotism <laughs> runs deep at this Texas ranch. It's a good life here. The wooden flag symbolizes their love of country, but Justin Rozier knows loss too. I was nine months old when he died. In 2003, Justin's dad, Army First Lieutenant Jonathan Rozier, was killed in Iraq. Since memories with him don't exist, Justin cherishes anything that once belonged to his father. Like these are the boots. We're actually gonna get these refitted so that I can wear them. That's why his mom, Jessica, wanted to find her husband's once cherished car for Justin to drive. I wanted the car that his dad actually drove. I wanted the car that was his dad's. After John died, she had to sell the 99 Toyota Celica convertible to make ends meet. I was shuffling through these old papers and I pulled out this registration from 2002, which was the last time that we had registered the car in Texas. She knew finding it was a long shot. Maybe I'll just put it out on Facebook because people can find anything on Facebook. As the post got shared and shared and shared, the message made its way to Pleasant Grove, Utah, where the car was found. My phone dinged and I looked at it and the first thing I saw was we found your car. We found the car. Like, after all this time, like it's still there. We found it. But the question remained, would the owner sell? And it just makes me so emotional thinking about this. Like if he had said no, like I would have been crushed. That's when complete strangers to Jessica entered the picture. They wanted to buy the car for Justin. I had a GoFundMe campaign drafted. So when this car was found, I was gonna push enter, right? And we threw it on that community page uh, here in Pleasant Grove, follow the flag community. And as soon as the car was found, there it went and it funds. And then all of a sudden, within a couple days, we have the money. For Jessica, they were offering more than just help with the car, but a sense of healing too. It was like these people just decided After for a kid they don't even know that they're gonna do this for him because of the sacrifice his dad made and I was just floored. It started out small big feeling and as more people got involved and hearing more stories, it is truly an opportunity that is easy. Everybody that we called, immediate, no questions asked of dollar value, what can I do to help? It was easy. We volunteered to do a project. I just wish more people in the world had the opportunity to taste what we just got to taste. It tugged at your heartstrings, it really did. And, um, anything to connect a child with his father was just a, a story tell in itself. Kyle, his friend Art Maxwell, and their sons drove the car from Utah to Texas to surprise Justin for his 15th birthday. The mileage didn't seem to add up on the gas. We paid less than we should have. It was just, there was, there was literally some angels behind us just giving us a push. Justin was speechless. I'm all like, wait a second. What is this? At that point, I was just like, like I just couldn't talk. Like there was like too many things going on. Like I was happy, I was excited. I was like, just like, it was too much for me to handle. They all wanted to do this for you so that you have a piece of their dad. And for Jessica, it gave her something she never received 15 years ago. It was pretty um, emotional for me to be on the receiving end of watching that car come home. I didn't ever get that, you know? It was probably one of the biggest moments of my personal life seeing that car come home. It's a moment I won't ever forget. 
I know it's a moment that my 11 year old will never forget. To me, it's a new car. It looks like it just came off the lot. Because of the, uh, vinyl Being able to learn to drive in the same car that he learned to drive in, it's kind of like him teaching me to drive it. You hear about all the bad stuff in the world, but then, then somebody comes along and changes your whole view. Like, everybody is intrinsically good. They just have to be because these people exist. There's a spirit about it. There's something about it up there that opens a window, opens a door. It, it just is changing people on its own. Whether in Texas or hanging in the canyon in Pleasant Grove, Utah, or even on the slopes of Sundance Ski Resort, where 100 volunteers skied the giant flag down the mountain to kick off the Winter Olympics. I'm sure that every one of them had a different experience, and you know, that's the beauty of it, is there's, there's a little bit something different in everybody's hearts and eyes that comes out of this. The Stars and Stripes have the power to impact people in many ways. It's the only thing as Americans we all have in common. The flag and the national anthem. We should protect it. And Kyle and Ron hope the Follow the Flag project continues to inspire, heal, and unite people for a very long time. The most important thing for me is God, my creator. Because with him, I know all things are possible. And for Kyle and I, our goal is to unify and bring people together.